We can't fight for reproductive rights without fighting for black lives. Check this out. Leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. I remember the late uh, 1970s when George Herbert Walker Bush was this patrician uh, Republican who, uh, you know, had a, a big mansion in Maine, and and uh, and he and his wife uh, Barbara supported abortion rights in the United States uh, in a big way, in a public way. Uh, all that changed somehow in the 1980s. Uh, Lise Hogue is on the line with us, the president of NARAL uh, Pro-Choice America and author of a new book, The Lie, L-I-E, The Lie That Binds. ProChoiceAmerica.org is the uh, website and uh, Lise's Twitter handle is I-L-Y-S-E-H uh, or N-A-R-A-L. Uh, Lise, welcome back to the program. It's been a while since we've talked. Tell us, tell us about when and how uh, we went from abortion being a nonpartisan situation that was supported by, you know, like the Bush family, to, uh, you know, this, this extreme partisanship around this issue. Thanks for having me back, Tom. I um, am always happy to come on this show. And, um, yeah, we, this Thank is uh, a really both historic and current conversation because um, the lie that we attempted to expose in the title of the book is the lie that the radical right tells that they were moved to public uh, participation, political participation, out of moral or otherwise concern for outcome of individual pregnancies and fighting abortion. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, as you point out, um, in the mid-70s, before, during, and after Roe, abortion remained mostly a nonpartisan issue, a nonpolitical issue, I should say. Um, and, in fact, the radical right was mobilized to political participation fighting school desegregation in the late 60s. Um, and then they sort of careened and converged with Phyllis Schlafly and the Eagle Forum's efforts to kill gender equality through defeating the ERA, both had a similar interest. And it was in propping up a largely white Christian patriarchy against a backdrop of an incredibly changing world in the 60s and the 70s. And it wasn't really until the late 70s that they landed on the idea that abortion as an issue could be politicized and weaponized in service of this idea of halting social progress. The first candidate that took it on was Ronald Reagan in 1980. He was very transactional with the radical right. And the first Republican platform that actually can uh, contain any opposition to reproductive rights was that same platform in 1980. So part of the goal of the book is to set history straight because what we saw in the forces that converged around Trump in 2016 was really a realignment of what we think of as an anti-choice opposition, but was really always part of a radical right that was committed to halting racial and gender progress. So this, uh, basically, this isn't just about um, uh, largely men controlling largely the bodies of women. Uh, this goes way beyond that. This is, this is about uh, white uh, male power in the United States. Uh, is that the essence of what you're suggesting? I think that's right. I mean, look, laws targeting reproductive oppression have always had disproportionate impact on um, women of color, black women specifically in this country. And you can't actually separate the origin of white supremacy from the decision to weaponize abortion and the movement that actually moved it forward. One of the things that we talked about in the book is that um, when the Federalist Society was sort of casting about for an issue that would provide a litmus test for conservative right-wing um, aspiring legal minds, justices, and lawyers, um, they found that antipathy to Roe, antipathy to the idea that women should be able to um, control their own reproduction, mapped really well onto antipathy towards other forms of social progress. That is a body of work that actually was replicated in 2019 um, that showed the same among the public. And so gender oppression and Racial oppression have always been intertwined, um, and they remain intertwined. But it's crucially important to understand that we have to tease them out in order to combat them. So back in the 70s, when uh, abortion was, and, and birth control for that matter, I mean, you know, the birth control pill was uh, legalized or approved by the FDA, as I recall, in 1961. 
Um, and, and there's been an opposition to that, too, uh, among the, the hardcore so-called Christian right. Um, back then, there was no group that said, we're the white male patriarchy. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's become more and more clear that that's the, the way that the Republican Party identifies itself today. But in the 70s, nobody was saying that, at least out loud. Um, where was that that patriarchy, that white patriarchy centered in the 70s? How, how, you know, it's a, brought it forward. It's a great question. And um, I think nobody was saying it because they didn't have to, right? It had been the way of the land since, um, you know, America was established on Native American land, um, you know, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you know, right. and I Europeans. think that what we, yeah, for white Europeans, thank you for what we, um, you know, what we try to trace in the book is that there were movement architects, forefathers that recognized that their lock on power was actually being threatened. It was being threatened by um, changing demographics, but it was also being threatened by movements that were ascending through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And it was um, you know, obviously the civil rights movement, which led to the black power movement. It was the women's liberation movement, as well as the LGBTQ movement. All of these were requiring um, people who were committed to a sovereign lock of white um, control um, to establish new institutions. And they didn't go out and say, hey, these are institutions dedicated to the white patriarchy, although certainly you can track um, intersections between the people who did this and and institutions like the KKK. But they were people like Paul Weyrich, right, who we really talk about in the book as someone who took uh, money from the Coors family, which we know has roots in, uh, in Nazism and white supremacy. And they started to build infrastructure, and they started to build infrastructure that was dedicated to maintaining the status quo. So whether it was the American Legislative Exchange Council or Americans United for Life, or Heritage Foundation, or Federalist Society. All of these institutions were built in service of that status quo. And it's interesting that you mention contraception, because one of the things we do talk about in the book is while the FDA certainly um, acknowledged efficacy of contraception in 61, the Supreme Court made contraception legal for unmarried women in 1972, the year before Roe. And this had massive implications, certainly culturally, where sexual liberation was um, really threatening some of the cultural norms, um, but also economically, where women who suddenly had access to contraception were entering the workplace and staying. They didn't have to leave if they accidentally got pregnant, and they were challenging what had traditionally been a male power structure in the workplace for access to the C-suite. We want pay equity, and nobody liked that or I shouldn't say nobody liked that, lots of people liked that, but nobody in this movement liked that. But when they were batting about this idea of, like, how do we build a Trojan horse around one of these issues, it was determined that, you know, contraception was a little too popular. Um, But it is not, you know, every time someone is surprised when someone who identifies as pro-life or anti-choice or anti-abortion also objects to contraception, I say that is absolutely part of the underlying ideology from the beginning. These things are not contradictory. Yeah, at least we just have 15 seconds left. How does this inform us about fighting these battles or, or, or for that matter, you know, waking people up? You know, Trump is the, the manifestation of these forefathers' ultimate dream, and we have to understand that we have to take these issues all in an intersectional way, that we can't fight for reproductive rights without fighting for racial justice and gender justice. And we have to lean into them, not away from them, to win in 2020.